singing about right now in John 12 Mary took a bottle of really costly perfume and oil and broke that box and poured it out upon Jesus and uh, Judas Judas essentially says you're wasting that that could have been spent to serve the poor and Jesus says the poor you always have with you but what she's done I'm really paraphrasing here what she's done will be told 
forever. See, worship, I think worship should be costly. And what some may consider as waste is what some may consider as excessive. Jesus looks at it and says, that moves my heart. Let's let, let me just read the verse. He said, let her alone, verse 7, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with me, but you will not always have me. <clears throat> and we know what moves his heart. It's, a, it's, in a, it's a broken and contrite heart. It's, it's a heart that says, I, I'm, I've come to the end of myself, but I have to have you. Yeah. It's, a, it's a heart that says, I'm going to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and all my strength. And because of that, I'm going to love my neighbor as I love myself. Yeah, amen. So I'm going to go back into this. But I want to invite you, whether you come forward or whether it's in your chair... I want us to sing this as if it's an offering unto the Lord. I want like, and, 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 and some are getting this and some aren't. I'm okay with that. But I want us to sing it as if we're saying, Lord, I don't have anything else to give you today. But what I have to give you is, is my heart. And I'm going to express what's in my heart with my voice. And I'm going to sing this as if it is a gift that I'm pouring out upon you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Go ahead.
Just tell me what moves you. Just tell me what moves you. Tell me what moves we're in this moment I'm wondering I'm wondering if there's anyone else that maybe you've been on the fence for a little bit been kind of riding both sides and you just feel that Jesus is tugging at your heart and tugging at your heart in a way that you know that he's calling you to He's calling you to give your heart unto him. And I'm not talking about just attending church, which is a good and necessary thing. I'm talking about saying, Lord, here's this broken mess of a life. I'm just, I'm just leaving it with you. If that's you in this moment, if that's you in this moment, would you just slip your hand up? Amen. All right. We're going to go back into this one more time. Because... The Lord's here, and I'd rather Him minister to your hearts for a few more minutes. So you can go back into it, Bob, when you catch your thing. Is it a fragrance? And I'll pour my oil out. Is it a life laid down? And here I give my vows. Is it a song I sing? And here's every melody.
we, uh, we as a people, we're thankful that you're here. <laughs> when you called Moses and Exodus to go, he said, I don't want to go unless you go with us. Lord, we don't want to be here unless you're with us. And so we thank you. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you where you're tugging up people's hearts. I thank you, Lord, that you're calling people deeper and further into the things of God than they've ever been. I thank you, Lord, that you're even tenderizing people's hearts so that they can hear and respond to your voice, Lord. So I pray, God, that what you're doing right now, I pray according to your word, which says that the he who began a good work in you is faithful to bring it unto completion. So, Lord, I know that whatever you're doing right now, you're going to carry it out. It means we don't have to try and finish the work. You finished it. You are finishing it, and you finished it. So, Lord, we love you, and we bless you today. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give them praise one more time, church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to go ahead and transition into our tithes and offerings. Um, we're extraordinarily thankful for those that continue to give and to sow into what the Lord is doing here at Oakland Church. We're just, um, we're just believing the best is yet to come. We really, truly are. So you can give four different ways. You can do it by dropping it in the box at the door. You can give online at Oakland NAS. You can text to give or you can drop it. You can drop it in the mailbox and so, or, or the postal service, whatever you want to do. There's lots of different ways you can give. But I'm going to pray for the offering and we're just going to ask the Lord to bless it. So Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to sow into your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we are believing that you will stretch the gift further than humanly possible. I believe that you'll bless the gift, and I believe that you're going to bless the giver, God. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, we are so glad you're here. We have a lot of people here today, a lot of people watching online, but we are extraordinarily thankful that you are here today. And uh, there are, um, we got two quick announcements. One, we are... Um, the Lord's doing a great work here. We'll talk more about it next week, but, but we are making big changes to our children's department, and I am just so thankful to everyone that's been volunteering the last few years, and I'm thankful for the ones that are beginning to volunteer as well, all right? And so you'll notice some different things going on. We're going to talk more about that later, but I just, I just want to say I'm excited for what the Lord's doing in our kids. Amen? All right. Tonight, tonight, we've decided we will not be meeting for prayer um, you pray it, pray at home tonight. By next week, we're going to pick this thing up and we're going to run with it. All right. So just want to throw that out there. Now I'm also, um, you can come on up dear. Uh, today, today you have a, we have a special treat and, um, I've asked April to share this morning and, um, she has, uh, we've been here seven months and she's preached all over the state of Iowa, except for at her home church. And, 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 uh, we felt like, you know what, felt like the Lord was speaking and it was, it was time, uh, it was time for her to, to share a word as that's kind of like the mother of the house. And so, um, so anyway, I want you to listen, have your hearts open and let's just expect the Lord to move this morning. Amen. Amen. We can do better than that. Amen. amen. All right. Amen. Amen. So father, I thank you for my, I thank you for my precious wife. I pray you anoint her. I pray, Lord, that you bless her. And I pray, Lord, that your word goes forth and it cuts to the joint and to the marrow. God, we bless you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm really hoping my voice uh, stays with it this morning. So <clears throat> sometimes, you know, you want to share something really upbeat and super positive and, and then the Lord checks your heart and says, no, no, we're going to want to share this. So this morning, my message is not going to tickle your intellect, 
but my, my prayer is that it does mark your heart. So I'm going to ask those of you that um, might struggle with that a little bit, just trek with me. Um, just give me a little grace. All right, so uh, we're going to just dive right in. Let's open up to Mark 5. We're going to go to verse 22. I'm going to share from the New King James Version here. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw, when he saw him, he fell down at his feet and begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that the power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? And he looked around to see, to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Heavenly Father, just send your Holy Spirit to help. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to go to the Passion Translation. I'm going to read the same scripture. Just then a man saw that it was Jesus. So he pushed through the crowd and threw himself down at Jesus' feet. His name was Jairus, a Jewish official who was in charge of the synagogue. He pleaded with Jesus, saying over and over, Please come with me. My little daughter is at the point of death, and she's only 12 years old. Come and lay your hands on her and heal her, and she will live. Immediately, Jesus went with him, and the huge crowd followed, pressing in on him from all sides. Now, in the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered horribly from continual bleeding for 12 years. She had endured a great deal under the care of various doctors, yet, in spite of spending all she had on their treatments, she was not getting better, but worse. When she heard about Jesus' healing power, she pushed through the crowd and came up from behind him and touched his prayer shawl. For she kept saying to herself, if only I could touch his clothes, I know I will be healed. As soon as her hand touched him, her bleeding immediately stopped, and she knew it, for she could feel her body instantly being healed of her disease. Jesus knew at once that someone had touched him, for he felt the power that had always surged around him had passed through him for someone to be healed. He turned and spoke to the crowd, saying, Who touched my clothes? His disciple answered, What do you mean, who touched you? Look at this huge crowd. They're all pressing up against you. But Jesus' eyes swept across the crowd, looking for the one who had touched him for healing. When the woman who had experienced this miracle realized what had happened to her, she came before him trembling with fear and threw herself down at his feet saying, I was the one who touched you. And she told him her story of what had just happened. Then Jesus said to her, daughter, because you dared to believe, your faith has healed you. Go with peace in your heart and be free from your suffering. Now we're going to go to Luke 8. Starting at verse 41. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler in the synagogue. And he found down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border of his garment. 
And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes thronging and press you. And you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all of the people and the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Just then a man named Jairus, the leader of the local Jewish congregation, fell before Jesus' feet. He desperately begged him to come and heal his 12-year-old daughter, his only child because she was at the point of death. Jesus started to go with him to his home to see her, but a large crowd surrounded him. And the crowd that day was a woman who had suffered greatly for 12 years from slow bleeding. Even though she had spent all she had on healers, she was still suffering. Pressing in through the crowd, she came up behind Jesus and touched the tassel of his prayer shawl. Instantly, her bleeding stopped, and she was healed. Jesus suddenly stopped and said to his disciples, Someone touched me. Who is it? While they all denied it, Peter pointed out, Master, everyone is is touching you, trying to get close to you. The crowds are so thick, we can't walk through all these people without being jostled. Jesus replied, yes, but I felt power surge through me. Someone touched me to be healed, and they received their healing. When the woman realized she couldn't hide any longer, she came and fell trembling at Jesus' feet. Before the entire crowd, she declared, I was desperate to touch you, Jesus. For I knew if I could just touch even the fringe of your robe, I could be healed. Jesus responded, beloved daughter, Your faith in me has released your healing. You may go with my peace. You see, Levitican law said that because she was bleeding beyond her customary time, that she was soiled. Everything she touched was dirty. The bed that she laid in was dirty. If anybody touched her, she was considered unclean. Twelve years of no rest because the very bed that you lay on is classified as unclean. You get the picture. What is the purpose of all of this? All of this is to assist us in seeing how her issue, an unending issue, would have facilitated her essentially being cut off. Unable to experience corporate worship in the synagogue, unable to experience intimacy, unable to experience community, fellowship, relationship, and unable to experience reproduction. At the initial onset manifestation of her bleeding, I can imagine she must have thought, this is just a momentary thing. It'll go away in a few days. It's a mild issue. It'll resolve itself. Then one month goes by. Two months, six months, one year, two years. Come on. You get the picture. How long? How many days? How many weeks? How many years have to pass by before hopelessness sets in? She couldn't run to CVS. She couldn't run to Walgreens. Her whole world was marked by her issue. 
the way she functioned, the way she lived, and the way she interacted with other people. Everything about her world was thrown into a state of suspense. Is this ever going to get any better? Am I ever going to get a breakthrough? I want to dive in today about private issues. About ashes. Everyone has some sort of issue or ash at some point in their life. Except the most dangerous ones are the private ones. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. See, when we take these stories about these people in the Bible, it's critically important that we try and find ourselves in them. And even though that this story is about a bleeding woman, men, I encourage you, I challenge you to find yourself in this as well. Because it's not just for women. It's for men too. She was soiled. Let the weight of that word sink in. Soiled. She was cut off, ostracized, continually being confronted with feelings of unworthiness. We can see how her desperation must have created an extraordinarily high degree of resolve as it relates to encountering Jesus. You see, society, and I dare to say sometimes that even religion, gives us self-help principles that are nothing more than a bandage for a hemorrhage that by nature becomes coping mechanisms. And let me tell you, the Lord does not want you coping on the fringes. Jesus did not go through what he went through on Calvary in order that you might be able to just cope. He went through what he went through on Calvary to make you an overcomer, to make you more than a conqueror, to make you the head and not the tail, the first and not the last, above only and not beneath, a lender and not a borrower, so that you can declare that everything that I set my hand to prospers and everywhere the sole of my foot may tread that ground, God will give unto me. That's what Deuteronomy says. This is our inheritance of every believer. And let me tell you, the world wants to tell you differently. The world wants to nurture that dysfunction doesn't want to see you get better. And the enemy wants to do everything to make you come into agreement with that. This is how it is. This is how it has to be. We've been given all things that pertain unto life and godliness. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Peace that surpasses all understanding. This is our inheritance. That's why principles alone do not have the desired impact. Because we were designed to have an encounter with Jesus, Yeshua himself. When I was um, 15 years old, I was on the cheerleading squad. I was on the dance squad. And I'm, I'm from a town of 2,000 people in the middle of nowhere, Kansas. Smack dab in the middle of Kansas is where I'm from. 
I come from an amazing family. Growing up, my mom and dad had very strict boundaries, very straight-laced. I had a very early curfew early on. I couldn't date till I was 16. I couldn't go to people's houses without them knowing whose house I was going to and actually speaking to their parents to make sure that they were going to be home. And there were certain people that my mom and dad did not want me hanging out with. The people from the wrong side, so to speak. In fact, I remember telling my mom and dad, well, my friend Amanda gets to stay out to like 3 a.m. I want to be able to stay out longer than my curfew, please. And I remember my mom saying, April, we have these curfews in place because we love you. And I remember my response was, well, can you please just love me less? <laughs> That's, <laughs> I remember that conversation. Somehow I had, I had convinced my mom and dad to let me stay the night at a friend's house after a ball game on a Friday night. And I didn't know what we were going to be up to. But somehow we ended up at a party that night. It was the first time that I ever drank alcohol. And I drank two 40-ounce Old English beers. And I got so drunk that I could not stand up on my own. And there was a man there that was there specifically to see what prey he could pounce on that night. As I made my way into the bathroom of the stranger's house, he followed me in, shut the bathroom door, and locked it. See, that night something was stolen from me. And when you're 15 and you think that the whole world is ahead of you and this kind of thing won't ever happen to you, I was crushed. I woke up the next morning with my panties ripped and blood everywhere. And I don't mean to be graphic, but I'm not going to water down this testimony because it's testimonies are important. And my friend asked me, what happened? And I said, I don't, I, I don't know. But I did know. But I wasn't about to speak it out. So I went back to school that, that week and I brought everybody into the school conference room and I said, hey, nothing happened. I know what's going around, but nothing happened. So I pretended like everything was good, gutted it down, did not want my parents to find out. But when you look back at pictures, you can see that the girl that was there wasn't there anymore. I quit wearing makeup. I chopped my hair off, started wearing clothes that were so baggy that they almost fell off. And when I walked down the hallway, I would try and make myself so small because I didn't want anybody to touch me. I didn't want to bump into anybody. A month goes by and I get called into the principal's office. And I walk in and, and he says, April, I have some questions to ask you. I said, yeah. He said, were you at a party? No. Well, we've gotten a report that you were at a party and that you were raped. No. few weeks go by I get called back into the principal's office and there sits my mom and she's weeping the principal said April we've had a few more people come cl- come forward and I'm really sorry to have to do this but you're suspended from playing on any sports for a month You see, when you're from a town of 2,000 people, everybody knows who you are. Everybody knows your mom and dad. So I had to sit 
at basketball games in my full cheerleading uniform. And by that time, it had gotten around the entire community, surrounding communities. It was in the newspaper. I had to go to the police. And during that time, I don't remember crying. All I remember is being so numb, gutting it down. And I remember my mom just beside herself. See, I was so angry. So angry. But I was brought up that it doesn't matter if you're angry. It doesn't matter what you're going through. You're supposed to be pleasing. So you put a smile on that face and you act like nothing ever happened. And that's exactly what I did. I mastered how to be a pretender. You see, when I've read this story in the Bible, I couldn't ever figure out why this story hits me the way that it does. And it's because I'm that woman. I didn't bleed for 12 years, but I know what it's like to be ostracized. I know what it's like to carry something with you for your entire adulthood, through your teen years, through your college years. When I went to college, I could not wait to get away from my hometown. To see that one event... That one moment in time changed my whole trajectory. It changed my perspective on people. It skewed how I viewed men. So I ended up in relationships where I was verbally and physically abused. See, I felt so unworthy. I felt so gross, so disgusting. See, I was brought up in the church. I was brought up in a wonderful Lutheran church. But I don't remember ever being taught about having a relationship with the Lord. I was taught all the Bible verses. I was taught all the rules. But I didn't know that I could take this to his feet. I didn't think he cared, to be honest. I thought I have shamed my family. I have shamed everybody I know. That's it. I'm going to go to hell. Like I literally, I legitimately thought that. Because I went to a party and got drunk. And that event had become my ashes. A big heap of ash. So when I met Michael, I kept waiting for the bottom to fall out. Kept waiting for him to show his ugly side. He never has in 21 years. But you see, for a long time, I recoiled because I thought, Lord, how could you bless me with such a good man? I have shamed you. I knew better. I knew better. And then he goes and becomes a pastor. Imagine being this insecure girl who was not raised with a line of pastors but was taught that as a pastor's wife you're supposed to be quiet you're supposed to be poised you're supposed to be elegant and I am anything but that thank goodness but for a long time I I was so scared to even talk when we were around other people because I was afraid that I would embarrass him. And more importantly, I was afraid that somebody would ask the right question and it would come out. And I wanted to bury that secret of mine so deep. 
I didn't want anybody to know. I wanted to act like it never happened. But it was the thing that was always there. Sure, I've had a great, you know, I've had a relationship with the Lord. I've had other breakthroughs, but but that root, that seed had been planted. And we're, I'm in my 30s. And uh, Michael and I had planted a church. And I'll never forget my Emmanuel moment. I just gotten off work and we were doing revival services. We were holding revival services at RCHC and Louisville. And um, Jay and Judy Jellison were there. And I don't know if you've ever met them, but they are, um, they're evangelists and now pastors, but they are an invitation to love. And they had a freedom ministry. And I remember as I'm pulling into the parking lot that day, I'm thinking I'd not sign up for any freedom um, sessions. Uh, Things are going fantastic at work. Ethan's doing great in school. Our, you know, the church is thriving. I'm doing good. I am not going to cry today at church. Have you ever walked in the doors and thought, "Mm -mm, nope, not going to have any tears. It's a good day. And um, so I sat down, get, get settled in into my uh, second row. And Jay starts to share. And as he's sharing, I don't know what it was that day. But I, I asked the Lord, Lord, should I have had one of those freedom sessions? Is there anything that I, I should have gone to for that and I'll never forget it the Lord just came on me and he says April come here I want you to give me give me your ash Give me your trauma. And I sit up and I look around. I'm just weeping. Tears are just falling. I said, Lord, here in in front of everybody, I'm a pastor's wife. And I don't do vulnerability very well. You know this. I'm having this dialogue with Yahweh. And he says, if you'll just give it to me, April, I want to rewrite your story. I want to give you a new name. And I took a deep breath. And do you know? Yeah, amen. Let me tell you. Sometimes we cannot get to where the Lord wants to take us carrying around our ashes. Carrying around our trauma. I had learned so well how to armor up in my career how to armor up in my hard work ethic how to throw myself into things so that I could feel quasi good about myself and about my situation but I still felt really empty inside there was still this this part of me that was dead So everything had just piled on top of that one instance from when I was 15. So as the Lord's 
lifting off of me all of this stuff, all of this junk. And I thought uh, it was the first time I remember not recoiling because he was so close to me. I'd always let him near, but just near enough to where I could still protect that thing that I didn't want him to touch. So we're looking into this challenge of this lady in scripture and our feelings of unworthiness being ostracized and her being soiled. See, I believe that if you bring your issues to the Lord, Anything is possible. However, most people have resolved concerning breakthrough in public areas. Most of the time, I think we get committed to seeing breakthrough when it comes to things like diet and exercise, but not on the things that he really cares about, the things that are transformative. See, verse 26 of Mark 5. She was not getting better, but worse. Have you ever felt like the more you tried, the worse it gets? I know I have. She spent everything she had on healers. It's not out of the question that this woman tried everything she possibly could, even the unconventional to get healed, yet she only grew worse. Hear my heart. I love doctors. I am thankful for doctors. I am thankful for Christian counseling. I am thankful. But that cannot be the only solution to certain things. It cannot. Or it's going to become this thought loop. This revolving issue. You get past it, you come back to it. You get past it, you get you come back to it. He doesn't want to nurture dysfunction and codependence. He wants to see breakthrough. Heaven is not a million miles away. It's right here. Just to reach away. And what if what you've cried out for for so long is just So when Yeshua's Yeshua's blood hit the ground from Mount Calvary and the earth began to quake, that earthquake initiated a tear in the veil. And that torn veil means that you can go boldly before the throne of grace and make your petitions known. There were thousands of people thronging him. And one went beyond the veil. Peter told Jesus, thousands of people, Lord, they all want to touch you. Yeah, but one did. There were thousands that bumped up against me. But one went beyond the veil. She got determined enough that her touch demanded a, a withdrawal. You see, what did her touch have? And this is what I want to drive home, intentionality. You can't come to the Lord casually and think that he's going to just take it away. Intentionality. Now, I'm not talking about trying harder. I'm talking about 
being intentional with what you bring to the Lord. I'm hungry that my touch stops him in his tracks. Are you? Jesus is passing through and Barnabas begins to cry out. And Jesus doesn't stop because he's crying out. He responds because he knows that this guy isn't going to stop until he gets a breakthrough. Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven or the prayer's cruel. On earth as it is in heaven. She had an opportunity for engagement and she allowed the depths of her issue to become a resource to help create a determination that would naturally manifest a breakthrough. He stops for none of the other people bumping up against him, but he lets her interrupt him on his way to an emergency. Nobody said she was going to die from this. In fact, Many people think it was a sexually transmitted disease. However, scripture does not say that. It actually could have been something from the sins of her parents. She could have been born with this issue. We don't know. But Jesus is on the way to heal a Jewish ruler's daughter on the verge of death. And that emergency gets interrupted by her intentionality. Be Jairus in the story. You're on the way with Jesus to get your daughter, who's on the verge of death, healed. And he says, I perceived power went out. I don't want your power to be going out when you're with me on the way to my emergency. (laughs) He takes issues and he turns them into testimonies. And the wounded woman becomes the trophy from generation to generation. You see, what you hold on to doesn't just impact you. It impacts your kids. And it impacts their kids. And it impacts their kids if you do not stop it. Think about the conversation that the Lord had with Simon Peter in Luke twenty two thirty two, And the Lord said, to, said, Simon, the devil has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith would not fail so that when you come through this, you'll be able to reach back and strengthen your brethren. It wasn't that God wasn't with you when you went through what you went through. It's that he wasn't going to use you It was that he was going to use you as a trophy of transformation so that your story can be permission for others to say, if she can be that whole after going through what what I'm going through, then so can I. Come on. He will still take what the enemy meant for evil and turn it for good. What issues are you facing right now that's going to open more captives doors than you could ever imagine what issue is the presence of god bringing you out of what thinking is the presence of god bringing you out of what dysfunction and temptation is the presence of god bringing you out of when you get to the other side of this it's not going to be the pill it's not going to be the psychiatrist or counseling that got you through it's going to be him I believe that there are some in this room that you're going to be able to say in one moment, the veil got really thin. And sometimes you're just a reach away from a breakthrough. I'm talking about private issues. What are private issues? Maybe you're going through some serious financial difficulties. 
and it has gotten you bogged so down. Maybe you've suffered a miscarriage in your earlier years, and that has been with you for years. Maybe you were molested as a child. Maybe you've suffered a divorce and you're wondering, Lord, is it ever going to get any better? Do you have anybody else out there for me? Or maybe you're carrying around ashes. The loss of a loved one. This woman's transformative breakthrough only came by way of her proximity to Jesus. She pushes through the crowd. She's going to get there. But you see, she was, she knew that it was dangerous for her to be there. Because if she touches him by Levitican law, it's going to make him unclean. He doesn't care. Because he knows what's on him. And he wants to get what's on him on you. You see, the lady didn't get a breakthrough because of a casual mindset or because she found a comfortable seat and waited to see what Jesus was going to preach on. She made up her mind. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. And I'm not going to be dealing with 10 more years of this because I chose to to sit in pacifism. In the midst of a supernatural opportunity. You see, he's looking for that heart posture. That says, I don't know how this is going to go, Lord, but I can't do it anymore. You draw near to him and he draws near to you. See, grace is not God throwing up his hands. It's him rolling up his sleeves. Grace is not God looking the other way. It's him staring it in the face. She was going to crawl through the crowd if it meant she could touch the hem of his garment. She had to go through the people that knew she was soiled. All the years of her going through the humiliation and pain of people moving whenever she came by and then repositioning themselves. It's that soil. I know it hurt her. So when Jesus passes by, I don't believe the woman is trying to determine if she has the fortitude to get there. I think she's just had enough. You might not want me to touch you, but may I? Redemptive transformation can only happen when you're at the feet of Jesus. What happens when you go through extreme disappointment and you have extreme private issues and there's been pain and trauma? You're just glad to be in the crowd. But he doesn't want you hidden in the crowd. He wants you at the center of his affection. And it's painful because it requires exposure to him. It requires you to open up those painful places. And to surrender. He's looking for your full surrendered yes. 
He's looking for your heart posture that says, I don't know what's next. But I want a new name today. He loved her too much to let her break through. Come in the dark on the fringes. See, he wasn't just waiting to heal her. He was going to give her her forfeited community back. You see, if she would have touched him and then just snuck back out and then tried to tell people she didn't have that issue anymore, nobody would have believed her. He wasn't just trying to heal her issue. He was trying to sozo her. He was making her whole. He was going to put it back like it was before it was ever broken. And I feel some pushback because you're wondering, is that even possible? Yes. Yes, it is. He was wanting to do more than just healer. He wanted to restore. He was there the first month when the bleeding didn't stop. He was there in the sixth month when the bleeding didn't stop. And he was there the third year when the bleeding stopped. And he was there up to that moment before that bleeding didn't stop. And I believe the whole time he was saying, I love you too much to let you get a breakthrough in the dark on the fringes. One translation says, he looked at her and says, who touched me? And she still tried to hide. You see, she'd been conditioned by her way of her issue to stay in the shadows. She, he was inviting this ostracized, soiled woman to become the very center of his world. She'd become the master of being inconspicuous and visible. Mark 5 says she came before him trembling with fear. And Luke 8 says she came trembling at his feet. Why? Because if she touches him by law, then he's unclean. And I don't believe that after she touches him that that she thinks he's about to celebrate her. I think she thinks she's about to be exposed because she just touched Jesus' feet. The hem of his robe. He doesn't want you on the fringe of breakthrough. You see, I believe he required her to tell him the details so that when he made the announcement that she had been made whole, it would have been a declaration for everyone around her that it's illegal for them to see her the way that they saw her before his encounter. Her name is not the woman with the issue of blood. Her name is a transformed woman who's been made whole, who is now ready for intimacy and reproduction. She used to be a soiled woman, but now she's a pure bride, ready to marry the groom for whom she was designed. Here's the breakthrough. His response to her would shift everything. Not just heal her issue, but restore her identity. The identity that was stolen by her issue. Mark 5 Jesus said to her daughter, Jesus said to her daughter, and I believe Jesus says to you, daughter, not soiled, not ostracized, not impure, not rejected, not dirty. He says, daughter, he says, son, Luke eight, he calls her beloved daughter. And the first words she hears directed at her after this encounter. Our beloved daughter, your faith has made you whole. So, so restored, made whole, completely restored. And he tells her to go in my peace. Matthew 9, same story. She hears my daughter. You see, he takes ownership of her backstory. He calls her daughter, my daughter, and he calls her my beloved 
daughter. The Bible says his eyes swept through the crowd. And I think today, if I dare, I believe his eyes are still sweeping across the room. And I know some of you might be thinking, I'm not ready. I just want to suppress it. I just want to cope with this. Keep on going. Just teach me to deal with it a little longer. But he wants to rename you. And your new name is my See, I love the story about the prodigal son. I'm wrapping up. I promise I am. You see, what I love about that story is that the son, when he's coming home, right before he rehearses what he wants to say to his dad, you see, his dad never gave up on him. He never gives up on you. He's. And he says, come home. And I think that's what he's saying. My daughter. My son. Come home. So, Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you didn't let me off the hook. Holy Spirit, will you just just speak? Just speak to hearts this morning. There's something about these altars. He can touch you in your chair. But there's something about these altars. They're an invitation. So here's how we're going to end this. I've got a stack here. You've heard the word, and I'm thankful for the word. If you're in here, and Connor, you keep strumming. I know your hands are tired. <laughs> you're going to be on a plane this evening, so you're going to be arresting your hand. If you're in the room, if you're in the room and the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart, and you're like, I need free. I'm tired of carrying this, whatever it was, and the Holy Spirit spoke, what I'd like you to do is I'm, I'm not going to ask you to confess it. I'm not going to ask you to speak it out. I'm not going to ask you to do any of that. But I'm going to ask you to come on up here right now and just stand right in front of me if that's you, okay? And then I'm going to give a little further instructions. But I felt like I heard the word of the Lord. If you need free, if something you ha- that happened to you, something that you did, something that's the Lord did in your heart, what, not the Lord did in your heart, but something the enemy's done, if you are ready to be free, I'm going to ask you to come on up here. And I'm going to wait because I know this is a heavy message, but I believe the Lord is in this today. So come on up if that's you. Praise the Lord. It just takes one. It just takes one, and then everyone comes. I want to just line up up here, okay? If there's anyone else, I'm just going to take a few moments here. I want you to grab one of these. Okay. If there's anyone else, come on. We got plenty. Praise the Lord. Mama, you need to come up here and pray with people. Okay. Normally I think things through and I didn't. So but this is how we're going to end this. We're going to pray that the Lord set you all free. And if there's anyone else, it's not too late to get in on it. But before you leave, 
whatever issue you are carrying, we're going to use our imagination for just a few minutes. This bulletin that you have in your hands, I want you to use this and pre pretend almost like a prophetic picture that this is the baggage or whatever you've been carrying for all these years, the guilt, the shame, the condemnation. And after we're done praying, I just want you to wad it up and I want you to just like leave it laying on the altar, okay? And then we're going to believe by faith that after we finish praying and with this prophetic act, because Bible's all through it, strike the water, right? With this prophetic act, we're going to believe that the Lord is going to begin to remove all that guilt and shame and heaviness. Amen? So those in the crowd, if this does not, if this is not you right now in this moment, I just want you to be in a spirit of prayer. And actually, if you see someone up here that you love, feel free to come and just put your hand gently on their shoulder to know that they're not going to walk through this alone. Okay? So Father, so Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you right now. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that that we don't have to we don't have to be ostracized as April shared for for years and years and years. I thank you, Lord, that who the Son makes free is free indeed. I thank you, Lord, that that the new has come and the old is gone, Lord. I thank you that you transform us, Romans 12, 1 and 2, that you transform us by the renewing of our minds. I thank you, Lord, that we have the mind of Christ. I thank you, Lord, that we can take every thought captive when it skids across or scurries across our minds, that we know that we can say, nope, that's not from the Lord. Get out of here. I'm taking you captive. I would pray that we begin to identify with what he says about us. He said, my daughter, my son, right, my beloved. I would pray that we identify as that and no longer as who we were before we met Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord, sweetheart. Thank you. Bless her. No more. No more. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for, I thank you, Lord, for um, an increase in self-worth to come. And not Oprah's self-worth, but kingdom self-worth. <laughs> I pray you would heal all the hurts and wounds and disappointments, Lord. I pray you'd heal all the hurts and frustrations, God. Whether it was our fault or someone else's fault, I, I, Lord, there's there's nothing too big or nothing too hard for your outstretched right arm. There is nothing out of that reach. And so I pray, Lord, you put your hand on things and you touch them. I pray you would remove, man, I'm going to pray this. I pray that you would remove any shame from something that even happened 20 years ago. You made it before you made I just pray you move it. Lord, we want to be a free people. You know, the, the, the gate is narrow, but once you enter in, it's the freest place you'll ever be. Into freedom. So, Father, I thank you, and I love you, and I bless you today. We bless you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Now, once we say amen, if you're done praying up here, I just want you to take this thing and wad it up. And I've got a whole stack of them. So if you didn't come up here, if you didn't come up here and you want one to wad it up and just leave it laying there. You know, it sounds silly, but it's a picture of what the Lord is doing. And you just leave it there. And the good news is someone else is going to clean it up. You don't have to pick it up and take it in front. You don't have to carry that anymore. Amen. Praise the Lord. You just wad that up, leave it there. So, Father, we love you and we thank you and we bless you, Lord. We pray, we pray, Lord, what you did this morning, it doesn't wear off, that it just continues to grow and increase. We pray that journey group time is fruitful. We pray, <laughs> we just thank you, Lord. We bless you, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Can we give Jesus praise, church? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.